It's okay. Apologizing my bands, you know, before coming to the summit, I got a call last Sunday. So yesterday it was, now it seems it's sunny, but yesterday it was raining like, like a crazy. So I was walking to my hotel. I went, uh, I went uh, you know, I, I got very wet. So I'm losing my voice. Uh, for tonight, this is it's a really tiny room. I have a microphone and the session is only 15 minutes. So we should be safe. But anyway, if you don't hear me, just raise your, your hand and I will try to repeat my, my press. So, so as, uh, I'm Ferran Rodenas. I'm a, I'm a platform engineer working on the Cloud Foundry project at uh, Pivotal. Uh, you know, I have been involved in OpenStack for a bunch of years. My first OpenStack Summit was back in uh, 2011 in uh, Santa Clara Summit. I think it was the, it was the design summit for Diablo. Uh, later, back in uh, 2012, I, I started to play with a Cloud Foundry project when it was open source. I was an external contributor to the project, and then uh, I went. Uh, I I I get uh, hired by the company that is leading the the Cloud Foundry uh, project, and I have been always interested in the intersection of uh, Cloud Foundry and uh, an OpenStack, because I believe that these two projects are not an exclusive projects. So they try to solve different use cases, but at the end, the core, the root problem that they are trying to solve is exactly uh, the same. So if you look at what happens at the different uh, technology, uh, technology shift during the last uh, 30, uh, 40 uh, years, you will see that you know back in the mainframe area, uh, uh, in the mainframe era, so. In order to get compute resources, you need to work for a big enterprise that they have big money to invest in a mainframe, and this is when you get compute resources. Later on the client client server uh, era, uh, you know everyone get a computer, so it was easy to get that kind of computers that of uh, computing resources. And lately, if you go to the cloud era, it's easy to get more cloud or uh, storage resources going to any kind of uh, public offering like uh, Google, like AWS, uh, HP, whatever, that what you can get on your own enterprise. Also, if you look at the different devices that are starting, you will see that you know you have more power on your, uh, on your iPad or your phones, on the different wearable devices, uh, etc. What is usually happen is that the business people, they now it's realizing that the, the power that they can get from all of that devices, being able to gather all of different information, being able to process that information, get a lot of different uh, information for all devices, is pretty huge, and they want to liberate that kind of information. But the problem what is happening is usually the IT people cannot meet the expectations that the business people are asking them. So what we, what we Firmly believe is that we need a radically new approach. If we need business people, if we need IT people being able to rapid innovate, we need a radically different new approach. And there are, you know, th there are two different vectors of that. One on the developer side, the developers, what they need is to be able to innovate, to fail fast to use new technologies, to use new open source projects, to try that once, to fail, to repeat, to iterate, etc. But also on the operation side, we also need a way to provide that kind of resources to our developers to be able to scale that resources. If the project wins well, if the project gains a lot of uh, you know success, then the operations need to scale the platform to be able to provide that kind of resources to the developers. In order to do that, you know, if we look at the, you know, uh, at the traditional legacy IT systems, you will see that in order to provide an application, there are different layers from the networking, for the bare metal servers, uh, to the operation system, the middleware, the runtime, the applications, the data, etc. If you look at m how most of the enterprises work, every single layer needs a different human interaction. Usually what happens is the application developers needs to raise a ticket. That ticket is being solved, but you know, for any kind of administrator that is going to provide a server, 
this is you need another uh, ticket to create a network for that server uh, you need another ticker because there is some people that is going to install a middleware layer inside that server etc uh, etc et so with with uh, cloud software and especially with with open stack or whatever it is you know it's it this is this this layer Get solved. Get solved because you know usually what happens is you have a dashboard, you have a some kind of self portal that you can go there and provision a server for you. You know, I was uh, one one hour ago. I was uh, Kenneth uh, Huai at this uh, same room. Yes, uh, it was funny because he was in a room full of uh, being where I mean people, and he asked the question: How many of you allow your developers to go to the being where I mean console and spin up a new virtual machine and from a bunch of people only one being where i mean people uh, ask it yes i allow my developers to do that but usually what happens is now you have a cloud software like being or whatever but i mean people doesn't allow developers to create the virtual machines this is what usually happens no so we with open stack uh, what we're trying to do is radically different so it's the user who has the power to spin up a virtual service if you want. Is the po is, yeah, he has the power to create a network, an isolated network for, for uh, the project, etc. But we also believe that this is not enough. There are a lot of use cases that this is pretty powerful. Just being able to let your developers to create a virtual machine, it's pretty useful. But there are a lot of times, a lot, there are a lot of uh, use cases where this is not enough. This is where we see the powerful of a platform as a services because sometimes app uh, application developers doesn't need to deal with the middle wall uh, layer or the runtime layer they don't care about that they only want to deploy my application that's what they need nothing more than that i'm not going to say that they are exclusive partners because this is still pretty useful there are a lot of times where Applications need to deploy some kind of uh, code software, a commercial of the shell software, uh, software. So they don't care about the runtime. They are going to deploy that kind of software. But there are other use cases where not. Where they didn't deploy just uh, an application. And this is why we think the platform as a service is going to help developers. Developers, they only need to deploy code. Mo no, uh, nothing more than, than that. So how uh, Cloud Foundry helps to realize that the vision. So what we think is that for a developer, it should be as, in, as, as easy as to target the cloud, whatever cloud, just push the application in case that he needs to scale that application. It's just a simple command and say, okay, instead of one instance of my application, now I need 10 or I need 100 of uh, instances of my applications. And if I need a service and I need a data services to run my application on MySQL, Postgres, or whatever, it should be so simple to say, I need the service, please bind my service to my application. And that's all. This is what, uh, what most of the developer, uh, developers uh, need, nothing more than that. But also, if we look at the, you know, the previous version where we talked about the, the uh, operations vectors, for the operation, it should be also very easily and very fast to scale the platform. If I have, it's my enterprise, I have a, you know, a Cloud Foundry or an OpenStack environment, and it's on-premise, and I need to scale that uh, platform and say, okay, instead of having uh, 10 developers because I'm just better testing, I need to deal with 100 developers, or I need to support another kind of data service, it should be very easy to do that. So what uh, Cloud Foundry provides? Uh, so Cloud Foundry provides uh, several layers. One of the is uh, the automatic middleware configuration. This is something that uh, with Cloud Foundry, with the open source project, it's out of the box. Uh, you will get a uh, middleware to run your Ruby applications, your uh, Java applications, your Node.js application, Go, etc. But if there is a customer, if there is an enterprise that needs to support one of the middlewares that is not in the Cloud Foundry project, it's very easy for them just to create a, you know, that kind of middleware to package the applications and just deploy the applications. So, and this is something that it can be shared. It can be shared in the means that 
Uh, if you go to the G-Hub, if you look at for cloud foundry, what we call build packs, you will, f uh, you will find that there are a lot of different build packs there that you can reuse. And this is something that we believe it should be portable between different uh, clouds. And not only cloud foundry. The cloud foundry build pack systems is something that it's from Heroku. If you are familiar with Heroku, you can deploy your application to uh, Heroku, and then you can deploy also your application to Cloud Foundry without any kind of change. And this is what we believe. The cloud portability is pretty, pretty important for most of the enterprise. Uh, also, uh, you know, lately there is a lot of booths around uh, Docker. So we have been using in Cloud Foundry, we have been using Linux containers for a while. Uh, since the one of the since we started the pro the project, we we started using Linux containers, and what usually happens is when when you start running with with Docker, what happens if if you want to run a, just a, a Docker container is pretty easy. You know you can download the Docker binary, your Docker CLI, just on your Linux machine. You can uh, start a daemon, create an image or the line one one of the image, and that's all, and run it. But what happens when you need when you start dealing with lots of different containers. And when I say lots, it's about 1,000 containers. How you are going to orchestrate all of the different containers? In a single host, in a multiple host, how you are going to get the logs for that Linux containers? So this is something that a platform like La Foundry is solving for you. Right now, we are using Linux containers. We are not using Docker. In the next release of the Cloud Foundry uh, project, we are going also to support a Docker image. So it will be very easy to have you know, a full cluster of uh, hosts, and it will be re uh, really easy to orchestrate your Docker uh, image on that batch of, of clusters. <coughs> oh, sorry. So what else? Uh, you know, wh when we talk about, uh, you know, just about the service binder, when, uh, usually the applications, they always rely on a data services. They need a data service to run. You know, making a, a, an application that is only code, you know, it makes no sense. Uh, so what happens is Cloud Foundry provides an easy way to bind a service to an application. It's so easy to say, okay, this is the marketplace of my data services that I'm providing to my applications, and with just a command, and say bind my service to my application, and you are all set. Also, it provides high availability and scaling. Uh, so w one of the things that Cloud Foundry also provides is uh, if for some reason one of your application dies, or an instance of your application dies, Cloud Foundry is going to take care of that for you. So it's going to restart automatically the application for you. If you have, for example, a hundred of instances, for some reason one of the instances of that application is going to fail, it's going to restart for you. But what more, what happens you have a cluster of different hosts, and one of the hosts dies. No, we talk, at, you know, in the, in the panel, I was talking about the, the ephemeral of the different virtual machines. If you go to one of the cloud uh, uh, public offerings, to the, for example, AWS, what happens in if AWS is going to restart your server? This is something that happened, at, you know, some, some weeks ago. No, do the Sherlock. Okay, I'm going to restart one third or the full. You know, all of the machines. What is going to happen? What is going to happen is that, in, in that case, Cloud Foundry is going to take care for that for you. What is going to happen is one of the hosts is going down. Cloud Foundry is going to realize that if you set uh, five instances of an application at, mm, and there is only four, because one was on the host that has been restarted or has been killed, then it's going to create another instance of that application on a different host. And this happens uh, automatically. Also, in terms of monitoring, logs, etc., what usually happens is, most of the times, if you look at the previous slide, when we talked about having uh, developers being in care of the middleware or the operation being in care of the middleware, what happens when you need to, there is a problem with your applications, and you need to get the logs for applications. What usually happens in more enterprises is that developers needs to open, a, needs to raise a ticket, and say, hey, I need to get the logs. It should happen two things. One is that a mean is going to get ECCH credentials to that developer. And you know, in terms of security, this is not the, the best approach. Or the mean people is going to get the logs and is going to send the logs to the to the developer. But this is going to take a while. So with, with you know with platform like Cloud Foundry, you get a firehose of the logs of your application. 
Also, if you are the main people that are in care of the foundry cluster, you are going also to get the firehose of the different logs of the different applications. So it's very easy, if you have any problem with your applications, to get the logs without having any kind of access to uh, your virtual machine. Also, you know, uh, uh, when we talk about having a big cluster of host and you ha um, having a lot of different data services, what usually happens is that you need some kind of network isolation or, or security groups, for example. You have a cluster where you are running your double open applications and you have a data service that, is, is for example, is for production. You don't want that your testing applications get access to the production environment. So this is something that in most enterprises happen. So Cloud Foundry also uh, provides you with uh, network isolation and, and security groups. And also it provides you uh, what, what is uh, the, the role and policy management. No? Uh, so sometimes you, in order uh, to separate or isolate the different departments in your org and being able just for people on a, on a single department to access the applications and not being able to see applications of a different department, you need some kind of isolation. So Cloud Foundry also provides that kind of, of role-based access. And obviously, you know, uh, Cloud Foundry needs to run <laughs> anywhere. And this is, you know, we, we always believe that the best way to run a Cloud Foundry is on top of, uh, of an open stack. So Cloud Foundry is agnostic in terms of the infrastructure as services. It doesn't need any kind you know, of uh, access to an API, an OpenST API, or a VMware API, etc. There is another tool behind Cloud Foundry, this is what we call Bosch, that is able to uh, deploy Cloud Foundry on whatever infrastructure. And we think also that the best way to deploy Cloud Foundry is on OpenStack. And we also, you know, very proud of uh, you know, sharing the, the journey of uh, Cloud Foundry with a lot of different uh, companies. And most of the companies is also members of the OpenStack Foundation. So we have created what we call the Cloud Foundry Foundation. This is something that we are still spinning up. Uh, so three weeks ago, we, we shared it with the community, which are the bylaws of the, of the Cloud Foundry community, which is the guidelines, which are the board, and they are heavily inspired with the OpenStack Foundation. And we're very proud that most of the company are also as IBM, Rackspace, HP, et cetera, are also on the same journey of deploying a uh, Cloud Foundry on, on OpenStack. So, you know, it's, that's the short talk is just about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, you know, the best way, if you want to try Cloud Foundry, the best way to try Cloud Foundry, you want, you know, if you don't want to spin up your own infrastructure, the best way is to just try one of the public uh, offerings of Cloud Foundry. Uh, it will be the Pivotal Web Services, it will be IBM uh, Bluemix, Aninite is another company that is working here in, in Europe. If you have some kind of you know, constraints in, in terms of data allows, et cetera, and you are only allowed to test your application or your data services in Europe, you can try Aninite. And you have also the HP uh, Allium platform. Also, if you want to deploy it on your on your on-premise, and if you are going to try uh, on OpenStack, so the HP Alien, I think that last week, you know, they released a nice installer on how to deploy uh, the Cloud Foundry platform on top of HP Alien running on-premise. And that's all. Uh, if you have any kind of questions, I'm, I'm open to that. So, so Cloud Foundry by itself doesn't provide an auto-scaling system. So if you want to scale your application, then you need to instruct Cloud Foundry to scale your application to a number of instances that you want. Saying that, there are some commercial offerings that provide an auto-scaling. And that kind of auto-scaling, it depends on uh, you know, different variables. One could be CPU, another one could be memory. Right. Right, right, right. So it's, or heat. So it's, it's based on CPU, it's based on memory, or it's based on a schedule. For example, you know, I know that my branches open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and only on weekdays. So I can program my instance of my applications. Okay, I need 100 of instance of my application during that period of time and 
off that time, on we uh, weekends, etc., then I can scale down my application to just having one or, or none at all. But this is also, you know, it's, it's, I was not going to tell because this is an open source community, it was, but this is part of our commercial offering. Right. Yeah, went. How would someone who is used to using something like Tea Leaf for application performance to see if a customer is having a problem? Historically, people have been using things like Tea Leaf where they're doing spir uh, mirror ports or span ports off the Ethernet switches to get every single transaction the end user had. So if an end user said, I tried to do this, 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 did work. They use Tea Leaf or some similar product to re reproduce that. If we go to an open stack um, environment with um, Cloud Foundry on top of that, um, have you guys ever thought about how you'd even be able to achieve any ability to do user performance monitoring? Wow, that's a complex, uh, you know, that's a complex scenario. Usually what we have is, you know, I in terms of Cloud Foundry, what, what we provide is some kind of application performance uh, monitoring. And we, you know, we monitor different things. We, we, we number the number of requests that you know, the world cluster is getting, the number well, of so requests. That's kind of what Dynatrace and people like that do. Right. Um, they don't actually, they can't show you what the end user saw. So you have companies like American Airlines and banks that want to actually see what, when this person tried to make this uh, deposit in their bank account, why it failed. Mm -hmm. So they use things like Tea Leaf to actually record these kind of sessions. So right. when the person complains, the help desk can actually go through this chain of events. Uh -huh. Those kind of things work because there was a finite number of nodes that they were able to do span ports off and then take every single transaction and dump it into a repository. Right. When we go to these kind of ephemeral solutions <coughs> where the number of nodes I'm on and the IP address of a node or I'm exactly what switch port it's on, if I use an SDN, it's not even going to be a switch port. Uh, trying to track that can be rather challenging. It will be very challenging because one of the you know one of the things that Cloud uh, Foundry or OpenStack or whatever it tries to to you know to to enforce is that the ephemerality of everything. So you should not care about in what host you are running your application, you know. And this is <laughs> it's a really compelling use case. You know, I don't have the right answer right now to to say okay, this is what you need to do, because it's not the way that we think that cloud applications should be designed for. How to solve that? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, Sorry, just thing, to be uh, fair. You solve your complex user experience. Uh, so if it's a really simple transaction like Netflix, uh, it's probably not a, a big deal. But if you start doing complicated things like airline reservations or banking negotiations, trying to do wire transfers, uh, being able to track why it failed uh, um, uh, is somewhat uh, important because it's the trying to find the black swan type of event. Right, 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 right. You know, I, I'm gonna say I don't, I don't have the answer right now. No, but it's a valid use case, right? Right. This is what you know. I usually think when, when I do that kind of presentation, I usually say that you know, a platform as a service is not for all kind of applications. You know, you should be uh, very aware of what are what kind of system are you designing, and based on that, try to choose. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it's not about platform as a service; it's, it's about having a cloud. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's not the best use case for for that. No? Right. Yeah. Go ahead. So right now we support from Bo uh, Folsom to Ice House. Mm -hmm. So there is a gap on the documentation. I'm, a, I'm aware of that. So it supported it supported Ice House because one of the our CI system is running on Ice House. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that it was on Ice House. It, you know, it's, it's that the documentation is outdated and we need to update that documentation, right? <laughs> you know, usually what happens if you look at the OpenStack API, it has not changed yet. From, uh, well, I will say that, uh, yeah, Folsom, it has not changed it. But it's going to change with the Oslo V3, it's going to change, but, you know, it has not changed it. I always tend to say, no, the problem is not the OpenStack API. The problem is how you have configured the OpenStack. But there is so many ways to configure OpenStack, you can still use uh, Nova Network, you can use Neutron, it should change a lot. What the Perby server are using, you can use KVM, you can use Chen. And you know, this, well, this should be agnostic. That's not true. If you get a VM 
and attach a device to that VM, and you are using KVM, you will see that the device name is under div BDA. If you go to a chain hypervisor and you attach a this, you will say that the device is dev X BDA. So there is a lot of things that, that changes, no? But you know, in terms of the open, open stack API, I will say that you know, from Folsom, it's, it's everything is suppo uh, supported. If the open stack API is using the uh, it's B2, when we change to B3, this is going to change, right? That. Well, as far as I can submit a pull request, <laughs> <laughs> it should be perhaps tonight. <laughs> if I get to the room and, and, and I don't get I, I can submit a pull request today. You don't go to the party tonight. I, I don't think I'm going to the party. <laughs> I don't feel. <laughs> right, right, right. Any other question? Thanks, everybody. Okay, thanks. Yeah.